What's going on, YouTube? Eric Bauer, back again. Thank you for clicking this video. Now, can you stick with it? Because I'm not going to talk about music today. In fact, this is the first and what I hope is going to be an ongoing thing, celebrating my love for the fucking movies, for cinema, an obsession that uh, is likely only matched by my obsession with music. Um, but honestly, before I ever fell in love with hardcore, punk rock, thrash, death, grindcore, black metal, I fucking love the movies, man. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I always had them to fall back on, uh, serving as both babysitter and uh, eye opener to what was going on in the world outside of my um, adolescent bubble, I guess you could say. Uh, now, it would be fair to say that Hollywood had its own role in shaping. Uh, what I would become interested in cinematically uh, as well as I guess cluing me into genres uh, whether that be serial killers camp stalking savages uh, coming of age miscreants and deviants uh, sex symbols and a whole gamut more of I mean, could you say anything other than iconography? <laughs> you need to see that. Iconog iconography. Iconography. English 101 with Eric Bauer here on YouTube. Tune in for more lessons on how to fail at pronunciation. Anyway, um, before all that, there was an era of Hollywood that uh predated what became prominent in the 80s what became basically symbolic of the hollywood that we know now churning out trash and sequels and superhero joints that have no real impact uh, i mean i'd be lying if i said i wasn't entertained by a fair amount of them but uh yeah there was shit before that. There was shit before Marvel Studios. There was shit before Bloomhouse. Shocking, right? Anyway. So, I started thinking about it. Uh, in my head, American cinema can be kind of broken down into, like, epics. Not E-I-P-I-C-S epics. Epochs. As it were. Eras. Uh, chapters. And uh, film history. Uh, specifically American film history. There was uh, the huge ensemble productions from the 30s and the 40s, uh, giant casts, esteemed directors like DeMille, uh, and you know, just off the top of my head. Um, that was basically like the birth of talkies. Talkies, what the old people referred to back then. Movies with sound, with, where the people can speak. Instead of just place cards narrowing down the plot for the viewers. Not that there's anything wrong with the old silence. I love a fair amount of those myself. Um, that was a thing. I mean, that was like all of moviedom for decades until we got actual speaking in films and when that kind of happened like I said it coincided with that big boom of Hollywood uh, insane lavish productions uh, and sound stages that rival anything built in this day and age um, once that kind of crashed I guess that was 50s 60s ish you had houses like MGM and uh, Paramount uh, who didn't want to throw all that cash into uh, big productions. Um, and American cinema specifically kind of started becoming more independent. Um, it was really kind of taking a uh, page 
from Euro cinema at the time, specifically a lot of the movies coming out of places like France and Italy. Um, got a lot of cues uh, from a lot of the Maverick filmmakers overseas that were doing things that would never have happened in American movies prior to that. Now a lot of those a lot of those directors from Europe um, got a lot of their cues from American filmmakers as far as like the the how and the what of of basically making cinema. Um, so I don't want to make it seem like everything coming out of this country was fucking derivative because that's pretty far from the case. Um, all that's a long way of saying that uh, it gave birth to independent cinema, uh, that crash of big Hollywood. Um, and you really started seeing that in the mid to late 60s. Now, you can kind of narrow that down. Um, and I'm probably not the first person who's, who's done this. Um, I would kind of point to Easy Rider from 1968, the Dennis Hopper directed tour de force starring Dennis Hopper, Jack Nicholson, and Peter Fonda, of course, a movie that was responsible largely for launching Dennis Hopper's career, as well as Peter Fonda's and Jack Nicholson's. Before Easy Rider, Jack Nicholson was doing Edgar Allan Poe adaptations produced by Roger Corman. Um, and that's how a lot of those filmmakers got their starts, uh, was working the B-movie circuit. Clint Eastwood did a lot of fucking B-movies prior to being cast as the man with no name in the Sergio Leone movies. Um, you know, it's just one of a ton of examples. Going to the 70s, uh, the list of, of actors and directors who uh, got their start, that method, uh, gets even bigger. Um, Suffice to say, uh, that trend that started with Easy Rider was kind of like an introduction to a more cerebral type of cinema uh, for American movies. Um, and when I say cerebral, I don't want that to come off as like hoity-toity, uh, pretentious shit. Um, <laughs> because I, I kind of call that, that whole era of film... Uh, I mean, granted, there, there are a lot of like a lot of like wholesome indie movies that did crop up during that time but more of them were what I kind of call like existential 70s pulp um, pulp cinema for lack of a better phrase but they had that sense of existentialism about them uh, the whole trend kind of played through the first half of the 70s you started seeing its death Rose happened around 75 when Spielberg directed Jaws. I mean, that was legitimately the first major blockbuster picture um, in cinemas uh, outside of that early Hollywood boom. And, you know, there were a lot of, like, grasping for uh, the life of that um, type of filmmaking, but honestly... The Hollywood that we kind of know now uh, just came in full force. 77, Star Wars. Fucking George Lucas. Love that first trilogy, man, but he ruins everything. Even if he doesn't intend it. Um, <laughs> not his fault, though. I mean, that was marketed very clearly towards a certain demographic, which is basically everybody uh, in 1977 who went to fucking see Star Wars. Um... I was a little before my time. I was one in 77 when Star Wars came out. Uh, alas, I did not see it in the theater. Didn't see Empire either or Return of the Jedi uh, in the theater. Um, the movies were kind of like... A, you, you actually didn't really go to the movies super often uh, it, it, early on in my childhood. It was kind of like... A, it was, wasn't something that you could afford to do super regularly um, even with as cheap as they were back then um, it was like a treat uh, and I loved it I loved the experiences I had in the theaters back then as a kid um, but I wouldn't remember that shit long story short where am I getting with all this bullshit anyway there was a huge swath of movies during that 
seven to nine years of truly indie filmmaking in America. This first episode, uh, talking about the movies, um, I'm going to touch on a couple of flicks uh, from that time period. Uh, I'll probably revisit this particular theme a bit later on down the line because it's a pretty big list uh, of movies that I really connect with from that time period. Uh, to get things started, we are going to just dive right into this fucking thing with one of my personal favorites, uh, 1971's seminal and crucial Vanishing Point. I don't know why you needed to see that. Anyway, take a look. Name? Kowalski. Occupation? Driver. Transporting a supercharged Dodge Challenger from Denver to San Francisco. Background? Medal of Honor in Vietnam. Former stock and bike racer. Former cop, dishonorably discharged. Now he uses speed to get himself up, to get himself gone. Everybody's after Kowalski. Because you think we're queers. For one reason or another. Is there something I can do for you? Well, like what? Like anything you want. Everybody wants a piece of his hide. Maybe kill somebody. Maybe stole that big dude of his. Maybe both. I'll get that son of a bitch. They want to get him and put him away. But they'll have to catch him first. Ah, good morning, folks. This is yours truly, super, super soul. The wretched live prince business from K-O-W. With the round, round, cool, cool, wake up music. Challenger being chased by the blue, blue meanies on wheels. The vicious traffic squad cars are after our known driver. The super driver of the Golden West. The police numbers are getting closer, closer, closer to our soul hero in his soul mobile. They're gonna get him, smash him, rip the last American hero. It's the maximum trip at maximum speed. Vanishing point. All right. You've just been inundated with the trailer for 1971's Vanishing Point. A fucking fantastic movie. Now, uh, there would probably be a lot of sticklers out there and, frankly, fucking incorrect people that might want to pretentiously point out the movie Bullet starring Steve McQueen, came out three years prior to Vanishing Point. That's correct. It did come out three years prior to Vanishing Point. But what a lot of those naysayers would have you believe is that Bullet is a flawless film. Bullet is a boring fucking police procedural that's saved by the fucking cool-ass swagger of Steve McQueen and, like, a ten-minute car chase. The movie's long, too. It's over two hours. Um, ten minutes of it devoted to the car chase that shaped cinema um vanishing point for my money far and above in terms of shaping um cinema specifically based around car chases but it's 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 more than that vanishing point is more than just a car chase movie um which i think a lot of people don't give it a lot of credit for being um it's relentless in its fucking execution as a film. Directed by Richard Serafian. Uh, I mean, what to say about it? It's taut. It's lean. It's fucking making the most of its locations. Of which there... I mean, there's a whole lot of them. Um, and they go by at a real fast clip. So they really have to kind of just like... Make what they can out of those spots as they're filming in order to continually get to the toward the end of that story um 
It's the acting in the movie is fucking phenomenal. The chops of that small cast, kind of unrivaled at the time. Um, and I say small cast. There's a, there's there's a lot of extras in Vanishing Point, but the primary cast is really made up of two people. Now you've got fucking Barry Newman playing Kowalski, the driver, and then you have Cleveland Little, uh, also of Blazing Saddles fame, playing Super Soul, FM DJ basically the voice of God throughout the movie. <laughs> As for the story, Kowalski fucking picks up a supercharged, stark white, 1970 Dodge Challenger RT 440 Magnum. Now that's a fucking mouthful. The car is amazing. It's like a character as well. They should have fucking given it a credit in the cast list. That's how important and vital that car is to the movie itself. Um, he's got to get it from Denver, Colorado, to San Francisco in three days, and he's determined to do it in two. That's the plot, right there. It's pretty fucking simple, um, but it's not. It's more than that. It's it's on the surface. That's what there is to it. But below, there is a lot of subtleties, a lot of connotations a lot of um, tangents um, that movie deals with a lot of shit um, a lot of complexity in the details basically is what I'm saying uh, it's like simultaneously celebrating excess and simplicity uh, which is one of the beautiful things about the movie one of the things that makes it really work really well is how it just embraces that dichotomy um, it's awesome uh, it was super counterculture at the time that it came out um, totally embracing the anti-establishment ethos of a movie like Easy Rider which came out you know, three years prior um, but really kind of like amping that anti-authoritarianism up for the new decade of the 70s uh, Kowalski as a character loves speed both as a velocity and as a powder. Uh, and that's pretty central part of the plot machinations of Vanishing Point. Is that he's fucking high as fuck throughout that whole movie. Um, and you would have to be to drive a car that kind of distance in that amount of time that he's hell-bent on doing. Um, he absolutely brazenly disregards the law as the movie plays on. Uh, has no regard or concern about the legality of what he's doing on the road. Um, blowing through stop signs, traffic lights, uh, <laughs> passing vehicles uh, from the fucking uh, shoulder and beyond. I mean, it's, it's, it's insanity. And it's fucking just brilliantly, brilliantly filmed. The lenses used in that film uh, are perfect. Chef's Kiss, as they say. That's become like a popular thing coming up on YouTube lately. Chef's Kiss. Um, there's a lot of funny shit in this movie, too. There's a, I, Kowalski as a character is like in this state of like being high as fuck on speed um, and completely just brazenly disregarding any cops that he happens to roll by. Um, but he's also like, you can tell like at odds with some of the shit that he happens to see. Um, back then, like 71 was a big movement of like the whole like Jesus hippies. Um, and you can tell that he's really thrown uh, <laughs> by uh, that particular sect of people. I, I hesitate to call it a group because it's a pretty small amount, at least what's shown in the film. Um, and it, obviously, that whole lifestyle is kind of a head scratcher for him. Um, he's super disillusioned. He's a veteran. He's an ex-cop. He's a stunt man, uh, a fucking stunt driver specifically. Um, I mean, what? I don't know. It's it's really hard to, to go further into detail about this movie. There's 
like the movie's dichotomy of excess and simplicity, there's also a dichotomy within the character of Kowalski where he's walking this like, razor line of being in control versus being out of control. And he spends probably equal time during the film on either side of that line, um, just kind of grasping to get back onto it and get that balance back um, that is kind of dependent on him actually succeeding in what he's trying to do throughout the movie's runtime. Uh, it's fucking just, it's great. Barry Newman's performance, fantastic. Um, and I can't not mention again Cleveland Little, a super soul, um, the DJ over the FM radio, um, basically feeding Kowalski information uh, from what he's picking up on police scanners uh, in terms of uh, where not to stop or where to try to avoid. Um, and the interplay is fucking great. And there's a point in the movie that's just like <laughs> it's just super good where Kowalski's driving, he's got Super Soul on the radio. Super Soul's basically talking to him over the radio, and Kowalski's replying. It's almost like an actual conversation. It's it's just really well done. It's a great it's it's a great section or portion of the film amongst great sections because that whole movie's fucking great. Um, I don't know. Beyond all that, there's a lot more to it that I haven't even talked about yet. Uh, it subtly tackles issues of like consumption uh, within American culture. Um, it touches on flagrancy of, of excess, touches on race issues, touches on nostalgia. That's a big one because uh, you get a lot of flashbacks, short flashbacks, but flashbacks nonetheless that hint at this nostalgia that Kowalski is really trying to like keep a hold of throughout the movie's course um, that he slowly just kind of like starts losing through the tips of his fingers. Um, it asks questions like, what's life worth, really, at the end of it? Um, which is kind of a big topic. And for the type of movie that it is, I mean, it's it's a genre film, yeah. Uh, Action-packed, for sure. There's drama. Uh, there's some thriller aspects to it. Uh, some comedy, obviously. Um, but it does ask some big questions, and that's definitely one of them. Um, and it's just a fucking piece de resistance of stunt driving prowess. The driving in this movie is phenomenal. Um, you could compare it to like the original Gone in 60 Seconds, which was 73 or 74. Um, but Gone in 60 Seconds doesn't have any of the subtlety in fucking Vanishing Point. That is an action picture and kind of an exploitation picture. There's elements of exploitation in Vanishing Point but they're never overpowering. And they never really detract from what you're seeing on the screen as far as Vanishing Point goes. Um, it's awesome. It's just fucking amazing. Edge of your seat shit, for sure. And it gets my highest recommendation, if you couldn't fucking tell. So, next fucking movie, shall we? It doesn't focus on cars. It doesn't focus on hippies. It's not really as existential as Vanishing Point, um, though it does tackle some themes that you could say potentially cerebral. Um, it's definitely a fucking time capsule of the type of films that were coming out around the same time uh, from directors who wanted to go beyond just the typical dramatic fare that Hollywood proper was churning out uh, during the time um, so again we're going to jump right into from 1972 Michael Ritchie's Prime Cut Hi Ben Nick I've been looking all over town for you we sent Murphy down to Kansas City to see Mary Ann and this is how they sent him back. What should I do with these, Mr. Devlin? Oh, did you know him, Murphy? Yeah. Was he a good guy? Oh, yeah, he's a good guy. Then bury him. 
Lee Marvin and the boys are coming to town. Gene Hackman and his boys are waiting for them. Nick. Marianne. You eat guts. Yeah. I like them. Talk now, eat later. Nice to see you in the same old rat hole. You tell Marianne that I'm here. And not to get any fancy ideas about turning me or any of my boys into hamburger. You got it. Lee Marvin, Gene Hackman. <laughs> Together their murder in prime cut. Smart. You and Jake, you think you're big men, huh? You walk in anyway, you take down your pants and I'll take down mine. We'll see who's the biggest man. Why don't we just ask Clara? They tell stories about you now, good tough ones. Did you come here for Marianne, Nick, or me? Marianne. Marianne is freezing things at the ice house. Me, I'm already. What do you think of all this, Nick? I think it stinks. This is my country. Yeah. And I give it just what it wants. Dope and flesh. Something up the arm. Something to lick around the belly. You have a good time last night? Huh? Lee Marvin. Gene Hackman. Rhyme Cut. The gangster film that's a cut above. With a script written by Robert Dillon, Prime Cut is a fierce exploration into crime in the heartland, 1972. Lee Marvin is the star. You may have caught that when I flashed the, the, the cover for the movie uh, as Nick Devlin. And uh, he basically is a mob enforcer for hire. He's contracted to collect money owed to Chicago's finest, the Irish mob, uh, <laughs> by Gene Hackman's Marianne. Yeah, Marianne, that's his name. Fucking great. Uh, Marianne, as a character, is both a sociopath and a hedonist. And he takes a lot of pleasure in money and meat and not much else. <laughs> He's pretty amoral. I won't even. Say, he doesn't really have a lot of social qualms um, as a character, and Hackman just chews it up. Um, there's Marianne's brother, Weenie, <laughs> played with gusto by Gregory Walcott, and honestly, the interplay between Walcott and Gene Hackman is part of the reason to watch this film. When they're on screen together, it's just. It's, it's madness. Um, it's, I mean, where do I, where do I get to? Do I go into a plot synopsis? I don't want these to be just like play by plays where I just like hit you with all the beats for all the movies that I'm going to talk about. And I plan to do these pretty frequently, hopefully. Um, so as far as prime cut goes, if you want a synopsis, uh, upon leaving Chicago for Kansas city, now that's Kansas city, Kansas, not Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and making initial contact with Marianne uh, Marvin's Devlin, he discovers that Hackman's redneck gangster is also trafficking people. Not just any old people, of course, uh, specifically underage white girls, doped up, kept in the nude in goat pens in the barn in which they're having some sort of soiree, an auction, uh, where basically they're being sold off to the highest bidder. Um, and eating a whole lot of meat. It was a, a really great scene. You probably saw it in the trailer prior to diving into this whole uh, talk about <laughs> where Hackman's just going to town at a plate of fucking guts, basically, giblets and whatnot. It's pretty gross, um, but it's also pretty great because... 
much like every scene that Gene Hackman is in in this movie, he's just chewing that one up. Marvin, just steely-eyed, cool, fucking... I don't know. I don't know how to describe his character other than to say that he's got like this smirk on his face almost through the whole movie unless he's like pissed which also happens a lot in the movie um and the interplay between him and hackman is just fucking perfect um i couldn't think of a better foil for uh for hackman's villain than lee marvin as the hero mick devlin um anyway sissy spacex in this movie she plays poppy she's one of the uh one of the girls being sold off at the beginning of the film um, and she's also got probably the most lucidity of all of the girls that uh, that they kind of the camera pans around um, and has the wherewithal to basically beg uh, Nick Devlin Lee Marvin for help uh, basically asks her to rescue asks him to rescue her and he does pretty forcibly uh, kind of puts on a show and embarrasses the character of Gene Hackman and I should mention that Gene Hackman's character owns this meatpacking plant, Slaughterhouse, um, and that's where everything is basically centered around. Um, there are a lot of fucking great set pieces and setups in Prime Cut. Um, it would kind of be a spoiler to talk about all of them, just like beat for beat, like I was saying. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but chances are, if you know you've been watching movies long enough you've taken any sort of interest in movies prior to our current era um prime cut's a pretty important one and uh you'll a lot of its imagery has been co-opted into popular use at the time in the 70s as well as in the 80s and 90s um you kind of have to look for it a little bit but um there are also some scenes that are just so iconic that you'll recognize it even if you haven't seen the movie all the way through um and that's one of the really great things about the film is just how um iconic it is in terms of how it was filmed and the way it looks and the way some of those scenes were put together um it's just fucking great um now i should mention as far as the sissy space that character goes um she's 23 when they filmed prime cut she looks a lot younger so that's kind of like a trigger warning uh for anybody who's uh, a little bit set off by scenarios such as that um, yeah uh, kind of a I, I think it was kind of a point of contention for a lot of the critics that were reviewing Prime Cut at the time um, I should say Prime Cut Michael Ritchie the director it was his second feature his first feature was um, The Driver I wrote it down I wrote this shit down I got notes sue me um Downhill Racer, starring Robert Redford. Uh, that was uh, Michael Ritchie's first movie, which is actually a movie that was offered to Richard Serafian, who turned it down in order to direct Vanishing Point. So that's kind of how these movies are tied together. At any rate, I don't really want to spoil more shit for you as far as Prime Cut goes. Um, I just kind of want to give you an idea of what the movie brings to the table. And I know that I'm probably kind of bouncing around and... and yammering on a little bit more than I probably need to be about this um, I will say that as far as a character study underneath the depravity of Gene's, Gene's is like I know the guy, Gene Hackman's, Marianne still love that fucking name and the calm cool of Lee Marvin's fucking Devlin uh, it's really a piece about America specifically and just sinking into a mire of uh, excess and loss of moral compass um, it's not super subtle it's I mean, it's pretty blatant but there are certain subtleties about the movie for when I was doing a little bit of research about this and, and a lot of what came up was that it was apparently um, meant somewhat allegorically um, to reflect how uh, a lot of the uh, soldiers coming back from Vietnam were being treated when when trying to reintegrate back into American society um, and that's kind of like a theme that um, hits me a little bit close to home um, I have uh, a, a father who took part in the Vietnam War and um, he was very affected um, by 
how he and his peers were treated when coming back to America. Um, and he had a lot of stigma we had to get through, which took decades, I should say. Um, and so the, the way that the movie kind of subtly like points to that, A, it's something that you'll probably not even catch um, if you weren't aware of it or if you weren't looking for it or if you're of a generation that is removed beyond that point. Um, if you're a child of the 90s or the aughts, I don't see any way that you would be super familiar with what it was like back then. Uh, chances are the generation of your parents is not as further removed, dare I say old. <laughs> oh, Shuddy, where's my teeth? Anyway, <laughs> I'm rambling now for real at this point. Um, that's definitely a theme. And it's something that I really appreciate because they managed to kind of take that idea and make it into this movie that's just like this. It's like it's it's so many different things at the same time. It's a comedy. It's a thriller. Um, it is a mob movie, sort of. Um, it's also kind of an absurdist piece of cinema. Um, it's just, it's fucking great. Um Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think if I've got anything else to add to it, and I'm, I don't mean to end shit on a note like this. Um, you know, just watch the fucking movie, man. It's so good. Prime cut. Um, and again, we talked about Vanishing Point before that. Thank you for watching. I'm going to sign out for now. And yeah, expect more of these. I had a lot of fun talking about these two flicks. Uh, I got a couple ideas brewing for... Uh, what to touch on next. It's October, so I might talk about some fucked up shit. We'll see. Peace out, YouTube. Take care.